My name is Marcia Sloan Latta. I serve as Vice President for Advancement and delighted you're here. I do want to give a special thanks to those of you, and I know there are some of you here who uh, participated in Giving Tuesday just a few days ago, and we very, very much appreciate your support of our students. Um, I want to mention that uh, if you like animals and zoos, anything along that line, uh, you will definitely want to come just a little ways up the road to the north on December 15th because uh, with our partnership with the Toledo Zoo, with our Maza Gallery in the absolutely stunning new science uh, museum there, Natural History Museum, uh, we have started a program called Animals, Art, and Authors. And on Sunday, December 15th, Richard Cowdery, who was the illustrator for all those Marley books, Marley the big bad dog, you know, the big yellow dog. Uh, so anyway, he also uh, is the illustrator for the Fiona books, Fiona the Hippo at the Cincinnati Zoo. How many of you have heard of Fiona? Yeah, virtually everybody. All right, well, come on up to the Toledo Zoo on December 15th. You'll have a chance to hear Richard present, bring your kids. There will be great fun, hands-on activities similar to the type that we do at Fun Day Sunday here. And then, of course, later in the afternoon, you can stay for the lights going on, which are spectacular. And I do want to say we're very pleased today to have the president and CEO of the Toledo Zoo, Jeff Saylor, with us. So. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Jeff, and uh, Jeff serves on our board of counselors, and we really love this collaborative partnership. It's terrific. Also on your tables, you will find a flyer for Winter College, which is happening on February 12th at the Pelican Isle Yacht Club in Naples, Florida, thanks to the generosity and sponsorship of trustee Don Manley and his wife Karen. And we really hope you'll come. In fact, Sue, who you're about to hear from, Sue spoke at Winter College, I think it was two years ago. So that gives you an idea as to the quality of uh, presenters that we have, and uh, you, there's information there, so come down to Florida, or if you have friends or family there, please encourage them to come. Also on your table, I want to draw attention to a free workshop on unconscious bias that is being co-sponsored by the Finley Rotary Club, the University of Finley's College of Education, Leader in Me, and Raise the Bar Hancock County. This will be happening on February 7th, a great continuing education program, and again, there's information on your tables. And of course, I do hope you will join me in giving a special thanks to our sponsors of Fridays at Finley, First Federal Bank. So First Federal, thank you so much. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sotiti Karras to give the prayer, immediately followed by President Fell, who will introduce our speaker for today. So Titi is a senior pre-vet animal science and biology major. He is very busy. From Akron, Ohio, um, he is in the process right now of applying to vet schools. He's already had two interviews, more to come, and uh, we'll all be hoping and praying and pulling for you, So Titi, that you uh, get the offer that you are hoping for. He serves as the resident director of the Haven Residence Hall here on campus. He's also president of our mortar board chapter here and also very active in campus ministry. So, so Titi, please come and give the blessing. Good morning, everybody. Um, before we welcome other Dr. Fell and Sue up to the stage, allow us to bow our heads in prayer and give this day to the good Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful day of to learn to more about animal behavior management and what kind of life that entails, about 
all the animals and how we train them and how, these, how we treat these animals. And God, as we come closer to the end of this semester too, I pray for my fellow students that we can get to the end of that tunnel with our finals and that we can conquer anything that comes our way so that we may live a meaningful life and productive career. God, we are so thankful for your son's death on the cross and the ability to not only live on this earth, God, but to serve you in all that we do, whether it's veterinary medicine or for Sue's uh, purpose, to serve the animals and to help, the, and help train them so that they, they can be great and everyone can love them. God, we are so thankful for this day, and we pray all this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Without further ado, I would like to welcome our president, Dr. Phillip. Thank you, Sotidi. I already feel better, and the day is about to get even better. So uh, thank you for being here this morning. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our graduate, Sue Young Pasquin, who has become Mrs. only recently, and here she is with us. We, we send our gratitude to your husband. <clears throat> She is currently the Animal Behavior and Enrichment Manager at Zoo Tampa at Lowry Park in Tampa. She has been involved in the animal training community for 12 years and has been a part of some unforgettable experiences in that realm, including her work with Winter, the dolphin with the prosthetic tail in the hit movie Dolphin Tail. I, I am not going to admit how many times I've watched that movie. One for every grandchild. <laughs> In other exciting news, Sue and the animals she trains at Zoo Tampa will be featured in National Geographic Secrets of the Zoo, set to air this winter, so watch for that. Sue is a 2007 University of Findlay graduate where she earned her Bachelor of Science in Biology. We are very pleased to have Sue's father and mother, Robert and Marianne, here with us today as well. Welcome. I often say when parents do their job, all we have to do is stay out of the way. So thank you. Sue, please come. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here and spending your morning with us. Um, thank you to Dr. Fell and Marsha for inviting me to speak here today um, at the university. Um, I have been to Winter College. And um, it was so much fun. So if you guys are thinking about coming down to Florida, why would you not want to come to Florida? Um, but it was a lot of fun to get to talk to alumni that live down there and to get to hear about some amazing careers. So definitely uh, check that out if you're thinking about it. Um, I have up there that I am the Associate Curator of Behavior. I just recently got another promotion a couple weeks ago, so super new, um, that I probably didn't get an opportunity to tell anybody. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my time here at Finley, um, my journey to where I am today, and talk a little bit about my position at Zoo Tampa. Has anyone ever visited Zoo Tampa before? Cool. Well, you guys have an open invitation to come see me anytime at Zoo Tampa if you want to check that out. Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to talk a little bit about my time here at the university. So I was a graduate of 2007. I was inspired to come to the university because of their pre-veterinary program. So I was a pre-veterinary student um, coming in to freshman year and into sophomore year. Um, Dr. Peck definitely uh, taught me a whole lot. She was a little intimidating if anyone had had her before she retired. Um, so she definitely made sure that you were in it to win it. Um, and that you were ready for um, a life in pre-vet and veterinary school. Um, I met Dr. Reif, she's here today, and I'm so glad that she's here because she's definitely a super influential person in my life and time here at the University of Finley. Um, but I remember um, going to, in my freshman year, going down to the pre-veterinary barn and castrating and dehorning everything in there. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, um, you know, I'm a freshman, right? I've never done this. Um, but it was incredible hands-on experience that I would never forget. Um, but as I was going through my classes, I um, decided that I really wanted to have a relationship with the animals. Um, I was very intrigued by the medical side of it because I had worked at a vet clinic um, when I was in high school, and I knew I wanted to work with animals the minute I was old enough to have a job. I volunteered at um, animal shelters, got my foot in the door, basically wherever I could get it in. 
Um, but I uh, really wanted that relationship and the psychology behavioral part of it was becoming more and more um, intriguing to me. And with talking with Dr. Reif, Dr. Reif actually worked with dolphins uh, prior to her time here at the uh, university becoming a professor. And I was like, wait, that's like a thing? Like I could train dolphins? Um, so I was super intrigued with that. So I actually switched over to a biology degree and picked up psychology and found that I was so amazed with the behavioral part of it, and that's kind of where my journey um, begins. I want to talk a little bit about um, my time here um, on, on the dance team. So um, being that I am in a leader leadership position now, and that I've had a lot of opportunities to be a leader, I feel like I'm a natural born leader, but um, I was the president of the uh, UF dance team my senior year, so 2006-2007, and with Dee Dee Sprow as my advisor, I learned a lot of really valuable skills um, that would go on in my journey and definitely help me in some of the positions that I'm in today. Um, my senior year here um, at the University of Finley, we had the opportunity with Dr. Reif and Dr. Moody to go on a, um, a research trip uh, through Ecology Project International to the Sea of Cortez. So we spent an entire week studying blue whales. We were on a boat with totally off the grid, no cell phones, uh, no showers. Um, but it was incredible. So we uh, flew into Mexico, and then we flew to the uh, Baja, California, and then we were on a boat traveling from La Paz to Laredo. Took an entire week um, to look for blue whales. <clears throat> so we would get on our little boat, or panga as we called it, and we had a little bit of bigger boat, not too big, where we would search for whales, and we had our binoculars, and we would take turns looking for the spray from their exhale. So we would, uh, we saw a couple right whales, I think, um, I don't think we saw any humpbacks, but we did see blue whales. So if we would see this uh, spout there, then we would go into our little panga, or small boat, and go out with a researcher where he would harpoon the whale to collect a skin sample. So the skin sample is probably only this big, uh, but there was a lot that we could learn from it. We could learn what their diet was, what they were eating, when was their last meal, were they nursing, um, producing milk for the baby. So there was a lot that we could learn from um, from that whale, and so opened my eyes to a whole new realm of animal care and animal research, so not something that I was really familiar with at the time. So that definitely opened my eyes to a whole nother realm, like, hey, did I want to go the research route? Did I still want to do the behavior route? So this gave me an opportunity to really get out there. I had never traveled outside of the United States before. Um, I hadn't really even gone to too many other states, so I was definitely stepping out of my box and uh, the university gave me that opportunity, which was definitely once in a lifetime. Um, not every day did we see a whale. It was pretty few and far between, and we weren't guaranteed to see them either. But I remember on the last day, I hadn't had an opportunity to go out into that panga or the small boat, and I finally got out there, and the whale surfaced about 10 feet from our boat. So imagine being 10 feet from a blue whale. It was incredible. Um, so that's definitely a once-in-a-lifetime experience I will never forget. It was amazing. Um, but I still had my eyes on training. I wanted to work with dolphins. I met um, a student who had done an internship um, in um, the Bahamas at Dolphin Encounters. And I said, wait, that's a thing? I could do that? And so I had my eyes on the prize. I wanted to be a dolphin trainer. and I set out to do that. So I did whatever I could to get my hands on any type of animal experience that was out there. This is a picture of our little tents. So we would um, pitch tents on the beach at night. Again, no showers, no, no uh, cell phones, no nothing. Um, so it was truly amazing. There it goes. Oops. Back up. So I have a little timeline of my journey as to how I arrived um, here at um, being the Associate Curator of Behavior at SU Tampa. So I started as a freshman in 2003 in the pre-veterinary program. Um, at the time, I was working at the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo um, summers, working in the education department. Um, so getting a feel for what zoos are all about, educating staff about different, uh, educating guests about different types of animals and species. And I was still working at the Big Creek Pet Hospital, and now that I was in the vet, pre-vet program, they let me do a lot of assisting with surgeries and really getting hands-on experience there. 
Um, I did that internship in the Bahamas that I really wanted to do, which was amazing. So I got to um, kind of see what marine mammal training was all about, learn about guest interaction programs, and really open my eyes to what that, um, what that type of life entailed. And then, of course, doing the Ecology Project International uh, trip with the university. I graduated in 2007 uh, with my bachelor's in biology. And I was still working at the Cleveland Zoo in the education department. I also did an internship at the Akron Zoo in the animal care um, department. Still working at the vet clinic when I could on weekends. Um, and then I uh, landed the Miami Sea Aquarium internship, which at the time was the only paid marine mammal internship around. And as we all know, when we're graduating college and getting our foot in the door, getting paid is definitely a big deal. Um, so I got that internship. I got to work with dolphins, um, sea lions, seals, um, Pacific white-sided dolphins. So I got a variety of different marine mammals there. Excuse me. And I still knew, like, I wanted to be a dolphin trainer. And I did get hired at Miami Sea Aquarium in 2007 as a marine mammal trainer. Um, so that's where I began my marine mammal career. Um, I worked with 16 bottlenose dolphins at Dolphin Harbor um, doing guest interaction programs. Um, obviously, we train the animals for a lot more than just that, so husbandry, medical. had the opportunity to see a few dolphins being born and getting to raise them and train them from, um, from a calf. So that was incredible. I got to um, cross-train in shows, so I did dolphin shows as well. Um, got to work with um, some species of macaws. So I got a ton of experience here, and I'll never forget my experience there because they taught me everything about training. They were um, on point with their training. Um, I, I'm really glad that I started my career there because I, I don't think that I would have been here today if I, excuse me, if I hadn't. Um, <clears throat> I think I have another picture, uh, kissing the killer whale. <laughs> um, so I got amazing experience, but I was ready for the next step. What else is out there? Um, I wanted to move up. I wanted to be in a, in a leadership position. Um, so I had an opportunity to present itself at the Clearwater Marine Aquarium to work with Winter um, in, in Clearwater, Florida. So in 2012, um, I left Miami Sea Aquarium to go to the Clearwater Marine Aquarium. Um, I was also the volunteer coordinator, um, so a lot of those skills back when I was on the UF dance team, being the president, translated over. I was the internship coordinator um, at Miami Sea Aquarium and then the volunteer coordinator at the Clearwater Marine Aquarium. So I got to work with Winter um, and her prosthetic tail, um, very different than the dolphins and animals that I worked with at Miami Sea Aquarium. All of these animals were rescued, deemed non-releasable, and were in human care because they wouldn't survive in the wild. So with Winter, if you're not familiar, she lost her tail in the ropes of a crab trap, so she was rescued by SeaWorld, brought to the Clearwater Marine Aquarium, and Clearwater Marine Aquarium would be her forever home. So a group called Hanger Prosthetics uh, found out about Winter's survival story and said, we want to make her a prosthetic. Um, so there has been numerous models um, over the... Um, over the course of her lifetime as she continued to grow, as we found out what worked and what didn't work. Um, but that tail helped to uh, work out the muscles that she wasn't using so they wouldn't atrophy. So we would put on this tail through training, obviously, through positive reinforcement uh, training. And she would wear her tail um, for a certain amount of time throughout the day. So a lot of people thought that she wore it all day, and that wasn't true because we wanted to teach her to use it appropriately. Um, so she wouldn't pull a muscle or that we, that we knew that she, it was actually benefiting her. How many of you guys have seen dolphin tail? A lot of people. Okay, cool. Um, so the first film uh, was filmed before I got there, so I was a part of Dolphin Tale 2. Um, I got to work with Winter and Hope, and we also had a third dolphin named Nicholas, um, and an older dolphin named Panama, who unfortunately did pass away just prior to filming Dolphin Tale 2, um, but she does make an appearance in the film. Um, so not long after I started, we... Uh, we um, Sat down and had a meeting. They said, we have some confidential information to tell you. We're going to be filming a movie. You can't tell anyone. And of course, I'm like dying because I want to tell <laughs> everyone I know <laughs> about uh, filming a movie. And so I got to be a part of some really cool conversations about the script. Got to meet with a producer, what they wanted, what we wanted. How are we going to make it all work? How are we going to uh, make sure that the dolphins stay happy and healthy? And the producers were amazing. They were like, 
you, you run the show. You tell us what the animals can do. And if you can't do it, no worries. We have CGI and uh, animatronics. We're like perfect. So we got to, um, to look at the script ahead of time. Uh, we're sworn to secrecy, couldn't tell anyone. Um, but we looked at the scenes and what they wanted so we knew which behaviors to train. Um, so some of the behaviors obviously were already trained, like Winter wearing her tail, um, Hope seeing the tail. Um, there's a scene where Hope's fast swimming around the pool because she is um, afraid of the prosthetic tail, so we had to teach the dolphins to do fast swims. So things that they would be doing naturally, we just taught them on a cue and to go really fast and on cue when the producer wanted it. Um, it was incredible. I learned so much. Um, I can never watch a movie um, again the same because I know how they're being filmed. Um, we, had, we would sometimes be filming till one in the morning and one scene that might be 30 seconds probably took us several days to film. So it was a long process. It was incredible. The animals were amazing. The uh, staff and the crew was amazing. So they never wanted to make the animals uncomfortable ever. And um, I sometimes had to stop production. <laughs> if I didn't think that it was going to be successful, I could say, hey, I'm not ready, or we need to take a break. And they were like, hey, OK. So that was incredible. I'll never, ever forget that. All right. So in 2016, uh, an opportunity presented itself to work at Zoo Tampa with elephants. Um, I had known that um, maybe I was ready for the next step. I had kind of learned everything at the Clearwater Marine Aquarium. I loved those animals so much, but where do I go from here? How do I become a more well-rounded um, individual or animal care professional? Um, so what do I do? So an opportunity presented itself to work um, in the elephant and Africa team at Zoo Tampa. And Zoo Tampa is a very progressive zoo. Um, they were like, we need trainers, we need people that understand behavior, um, so come work with elephants. And I was like, ooh, I don't know if I want to give up my wetsuit quite yet um, and shovel poop, but, um, <laughs> you know, like, let's give it a try. And I think the thing that intrigued me the most is that um, the training aspect of it is, um, a lot of zoos are still uh, behind the times in training, so you'll actually see a lot of marine mammals start popping up, or a lot of marine mammal trainers popping up in zoos because they're uh, shifting to more behaviorally focused uh, programs. So I was like, okay, let's give this a shot. So I traded in my wetsuit for some boots and some cargo pants and um, got handed a shovel and I started um, working. Oh, I forgot that photo was there. That's Hope from Dolphin Tail. So I started working with elephants at Zoo Tampa. We have a herd of six elephants, one male, that's Stula, our male, and then five females. Um, I didn't know much about elephants, to be quite honest with you. Um, I didn't really know much about a lot of the African animals that were in our department, but I knew training. And so they could teach me everything that I needed to know about the particular species um, that I was working with, as long as I understood behavior. So, I seamlessly worked into that um, department. I loved it. I didn't even care that I was shoveling poop for the majority of my day. Um, you can imagine how much uh, waste a 10,000 pound animal can produce in one day. <laughs> but it was incredible and it was intimidating stepping in front of 10,000 pounds for the first time. But once you get comfortable with them, um, it's just like riding a bike, just like training the dolphins. Um, the thing that I thought that I was going to have the most um, trouble with is that the elephants are very slow compared to your quick dolphins um, moving around the water, but they're just amazing. I can't say enough about them, to be honest. Um, we had two calves uh, back in, I think, 2006, so um, we had a couple little ones, so I got to work with some adults. Uh, one um, older elephant who's 40, so closer to geriatric and uh, two little calves, so I kind of got to see a little bit of everything and got to understand their herd, and it was incredible. So that was in 2016. In 2017, I got promoted to supervisor of Africa um, at the zoo, and I got to expand my, um, my animals that I worked with, including giraffe. Um, we also have zebra, bongo, various different hoofstock, uh, hippo is Red River Hog, so our entire Africa area um, I now got to oversee and um, 
improve their care. So I was super jazzed about that. This is Randall, one of our um, giraffe, our Rothschild giraffe. And one of the things that I helped to do is to switch over our giraffe feeding program to more of an encounter program. How many of you guys have ever fed a giraffe at a zoo before? It's pretty common. Um, a lot of zoos have them. Um, at our particular zoo, and I'm not familiar with many other, it was you could buy some lettuce and you can go feed the giraffe. Really cool experience. The giraffe would most likely come up there and hang out with you once in a lifetime. Well, what we wanted is we wanted to kind of take the reins back in and we wanted to focus on behavior. So our guests now get to pay a very small amount of money to uh, come up to hang out with myself and my giraffe. And instead of just mindlessly giving this um, um, romaine or the lettuce, we now incorporate them into our training sessions. So we kind of knock out two birds with one stone. We get to give you an incredible experience where we get to focus on the behaviors with our giraffe. So for example, this picture here is just simple target training. Giraffe, um, every animal is capable of learning something. Giraffe are not the smartest um, tools in the shed, or <laughs> but <laughs> they're still capable of learning. Um, so basic things with them, basic targeting. Um, we did have a giraffe that was exhibiting uh, some aggressive behaviors towards guests because he would aggressively lick towards um, people, but if you don't understand behavior and the guests are up there just feeding, they're reinforcing him every single time that he does that. Um, so this allowed us to kind of take back control a little bit, reinforce what we want, and be able to give our guests a dynamic experience. <clears throat> um, I also get to work with this, um, white rhinos. Um, so that's another uh, really cool thing. The rhinos stole my heart from the get-go. Um, I love them so much. They're so tactile. They're so engaging. They love hanging out with you. Um, and as if you can't already tell, um, I love relationships and I want to be with the animals. Um, and so going from dolphins to elephants and rhinos, that was one thing that I was like, oh, I'm not going to get to cuddle animals anymore. <laughs> but these guys actually love attention and love affection. And a lot of animals do, and it's just finding out um, those individual personalities and also being able to teach them that, hey, I can offer this to you. Um, so the white rhinos will actually lean in, and we can scratch them, and uh, you'll stop scratching, and they'll lean in a little harder, like, hey, I'm not done with that. Um, <laughs> so those are the things that I really enjoy, finding out about all the individuals and um, the species as well. So in 2018, um, I got promoted to the Animal Behavior and Enrichment Manager at Zoo Tampa. Um, so I, <clears throat> I was nervous to leave because I was like, I was just getting my feet under me in the Africa department, and I loved the ele uh, elephants and rhinos, and I didn't want to leave my relationships to go and um, work you know, with other animals. But I looked on the bright side, and I said, I get to expand my horizons, and I get to work with every single animal here at the zoo. So I got to... Um, teach other staff members how to train their animals. So again, like I mentioned, a lot of zoos are behind the times in training, and it just meant that their trainers didn't quite understand. So my role was to teach them how to teach their animals and how to improve animal welfare in their training and enrichment programs um, by meeting with them, discussing their goals, um, and all of that. So I now get a hand in all of the animal areas, and I get to work closely with the teams and teach them how to um, uh, teach things to their animals. And one of my favorite things about this job is that I will get texts and calls and emails from the staff saying, oh my gosh, my animal did this today. He had a breakthrough. Thank you so much. And that just like melt, oops, excuse me, melts my heart because I do love teaching um, and I just love seeing the light bulbs turn, whether it's in an animal, whether it's with the staff. And um, that is definitely why I wanted to be a marine mammal trainer and why I worked so hard to get to where I am because those are the moments that, that make it for me. Uh, one of my other um, career highlights um, in just this past year was training a free flight uh, program f with our macaws. So we have a flock of 13 macaws at Zoo Tampa um, with our ambassador program and they fly free flight throughout the zoo to come meet our guests. So we got to uh, retrain their uh, flight path. So they were flying one flight path for eight years. So we had to untrain that path pathway um, and teach them a brand new route. And it was incredible. And again, like seeing the wheels turning and seeing them succeed is just the highlight of my entire day. So 
Um, I, I love large animals, as you can see, but I'm also kind of a bird nerd. So this was um, one of my career highlights for sure and one of the coolest things I feel like I've done so far. So. All right, so just um, a couple, about a month ago, I got promoted to Associate Curator of Behavior, so now I do the same thing, but I'm also um, over the Ambassador Program. So a lot of different changes are gonna be happening there, and I'm so excited for that, um, but still continuing to have a hand in all of the animal areas and teaching the staff how to interact with their animals. Um, but what's really cool, and uh, Marsha mentioned earlier, is um, we did get picked up by National Geographic, Secrets of the Zoo. So in late February, you guys should look out for that. And we're so excited uh, to tell our story, for people to see what we do on a daily basis and how hard everybody's working out there to create uh, the best lives possible for all of our animals. So stay tuned for that. All right, so I have this diagram up here. This is pulled from WAZA, the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And I just kind of want to talk about a little bit about what my job entails um, um, briefly and kind of go through what I do on a daily basis. Um, but when we're working at zoos, uh, we're always, how can we improve animal welfare? How can we make their animals' lives the best they can possibly be? And you can kind of see like what, the, uh, what good care is, so giving them what they need, food, water, shelter, um, veterinary care. So obviously, we have staff veterinarians, if not multiple veterinarians, on grounds to offer that for them. Uh, making sure that the animals live in a safe environment, but going above and beyond that and creating good animal uh, well-being or welfare. And that is giving them the social opportunities that they need, um, giving them mental stimulation through training and enrichment, and then giving them choice and control over their environment. So giving them opportunities to make choices for themselves and to give them um, a dynamic environment that they can thrive in. And kind of going off of that a little bit, I made this little graph. Um, so there are a ton of people at every zoo that um, go into uh, creating animal um, wellness or well-being um, for all every species that you see out there. So obviously veterinary care having um, a staff, so a lot of you pre-veterinary students that are here that are aspiring veterinarians, you guys will play an integral role in that as well. Uh, nutrition, a lot of zoos have commissaries where they're preparing all of the food for all of our animals and discussing and working together with our veterinarians to come up with um, the proper diet for each species. Research, so we've learned a lot about animals over the years and that's why we're continuing to improve animal welfare because we know much more about them now. Um, and we know that training helps in that uh, stimulating them mentally and being able to teach them voluntarily for medical behavior so the vets can come in and do what they need to do and it's less stressful for our animals. Um, so a lot of uh, reasons why zoos are moving in a more behavioral direction and having positions like myself to help do that. Habitat design, are we creating a habitat that um, would encourage natural behaviors? Do we have things in our habitats that um, encourage them to move and is it dynamic? So there's a lot of discussions about that as well. And then those social opportunities that I mentioned. So um, at each institution, we have um, institutional representatives for each uh, species, especially the species survival program, so animals that are threatened in the wild and we're working hard to um, increase those numbers, is are we giving our animals the, the social things that they need um, or are they solitary animals? So all those conversations are happening and we're all working together to make sure these guys have incredible lives here. And of course behavior manage management and that's kind of where I come in. Um, so I can meet with the teams and discuss their animal training programs. I'm privy to all those other conversations and I work with everyone there to make sure that we're, we're all on the same page and we're doing what's best for the animal. So why train? Why would we want to do any of that? Um, well, obviously husbandry care. So if we teach the animals to voluntarily participate in their own medical care, obviously that's a lot less stressful for both the veterinarian and myself. Um, the vet and I will work together and say, hey, I'd really like to get an ultrasound on this animal. I said, okay, well, they don't know how to do that. We're on it. We're going to start training it immediately, and we can meet with the teams and, and discuss what that's going to look like. Or maybe we have um, more complex animals like the elephants or the orangutans that just need more mental stimulation. So it, we might teach them more than just medical behaviors. We might teach them behaviors that are going to stimulate them cognitively. So with more complex animals like that, we need to bump up our training programs and make sure we're giving them what they need. Uh, exercise. So it's 
we all know that the animals are not in the wild when they're in a zoo, but um, can we still get them enough exercise that they need? So like the fast swim I was talking about with uh, the dolphin. So you're like, wow, he swims around you know, really fast. Well, yeah, but that's gonna give them exercise and increase their heart rate and build that up for them. Um, one of our trainers is teaching with one of our Simings, we call it a couch to 5K. So we're teaching them to swing around in their habitat um, on cue by following a laser target point. So obviously we can't go out there into their habitat with them, so how do we teach them to swing around? Um, we use a laser target, which is pretty cool. So, um, you know, things like that, thinking outside of the box of how we can get these guys moving. Co cooperative behavior, so teaching the animals to work together, or if we have animals that maybe don't necessarily like each other, we can use positive reinforcement to build up a positive association um, with each other there. Education, research um, for obvious reasons, and then reducing aggression. So um, a lot of times the teams come to me and say, I have this animal who is um, being aggressive towards me or towards another animal. We can take a hard look at that, see what's causing that, and then use training to um, reduce that. So I meet with all the teams, and I discuss what their primary goals and area needs are. And um, when I first started at the zoo, I was called a fish chucker because I was a marine mammal trainer. And they were like, well, what do you want to do, teach our animals to do tricks? I said, no, that's not, that's not why I'm here. Um, we have a lot of other goals uh, that we can focus on. So I sit down with the teams and I say, what are your needs? What are your wants? What are your animals' needs? Uh, for example, if you have an older animal that might need to learn an ultrasound, um, or um, male orangutans are known for having um, respiratory issues. So maybe we need to start now and start teaching that animal to accept a nebulizer. So our, our male orangutan takes a nebulizer treatment uh, twice a day. Um, and he'll take it like it's just no big deal. Um, so through positive reinforcement, we can teach some really incredible things. So uh, determining those, um, those areas uh, of need for the teams. Um, keeping the keepers safe, so making sure that we're staying safe around our animals. Obviously, we work with a lot of dangerous animals. So how do we interact with our animals safely, whether it be feeding so we don't get a finger bit off, or uh, feeding the uh, elephants, for example, so that we don't get wrapped up in a trunk. So we have to think about those things as well. Uh, breeding. Uh, one of my favorite highlights, I think, from this year is we had a male and a female koala, a Queensland koala. Uh, we had had them for quite some time. We had never had a joey, um, and the team just didn't quite understand the behavioral part of it. So what we started doing is just changing their environment, because if you can imagine how hard it would be to motivate a koala who only eats one thing, eucalyptus, and sleeps about 22 hours a day, <laughs> where are you going to get your training in? Um, so training looks different to each animal, and what we did is they always got their food. It was just out there. Food's there always. They always knew it was going to happen. And I was like, OK, let's, let's shake it up a little bit. We're going to shift them into this space, and no food's going to be here. And they're like, what? I'm like, we're going to feed them their food. Don't worry. <laughs> but it's not going to come right now, because you have nothing else in your back pocket to associate yourself with positive things other than your, your eucalyptus. Well, I wish I had a video of this, but the first time that our female koala shifted into a space without food, it blew her mind. She was in there vocalizing like, where is my food? What did you guys do? Um, so we created a little bit of interest there. We switched their environment, and then we started what we called um, shifting scenarios. So we would open one den without food, put food in there, they would shift over. They would eat for a little bit, then we would take it out, put it new bundles in the next room, and we were teaching them to go back and forth. So our koalas now shift back and forth on cue. They can go outside, they can go from den to den. And what we also did is um, created a dynamic environment where they felt comfortable, where they were actually having to work a little bit for their food, because believe it or not, animals would actually work for their food more than they want it just handed on a platter. Um, and it uh, got them interested in each other, and they bred, and we had our first successful joey this year. Um, so I don't want to say it was because of the training, but <laughs> it could have been. <laughs> so coincidentally, they coincided with one another. And uh, the first opportunity we've had to work with an entirely green animal, so animals that didn't have a history of training prior to, 
and that Joey now voluntarily goes on to the trainers. They can uh, shift them onto a prop to get weights. Um, the mom is comfortable with us handling the Joey, and we've taught the Joey with the eucalyptus to just step right onto us. So if we have to check pouches or we have to um, do any type of medical procedure, the animals are now entirely comfortable with that. So training looks different um, with different animals, so it's not all just teaching them to, you know, sw swim fast or, you know, uh, swing around the trees. Um, so all these reasons here, even transports, uh, we successfully transported our chimpanzees um, without being sedated for the very first time in our institution where we had uh, a chance to voluntarily crate them. So we taught them how to crate, they were comfortable shutting the door, and then they were well on their way to another zoo. So training is, is incredibly important and so much less stressful to our animals. So the learning process is, so how do we do that? <laughs> so we use classical and operant conditioning. So classical conditioning being the association of two things. So we do a lot of bridge conditioning. So if you've ever uh, seen the whistle that we use for marine mammals, we use a whistle at our zoo as well. It's crisp, it's precise, it's very clear to the animal, um, but your bridge can be just about anything. If you have pets at home, you'd probably say, good boy, good girl, right? So that is a bridge. So it just bridges the time gap from when they do something right to when they get their reinforcement. Um, we can also use classical conditioning with recall training. So training a sound to get all the animals to maybe shift inside. So for example, by training a recall, um, let's say heaven forbid that someone falls into a habitat. Um, a guest falls into a habitat. The trainers could ring the bell, whatever sound they want, and the animals will come running and come uh, into their den because we've associated with that sound with something that they find highly, highly reinforcing. Um, so we put um, train recalls with all the animals. Uh, we just started training um, within our aviary. In our main aviary, we have about 80 different birds, all of which um, sometimes live very high in the trees, and it's takes a while or it's near to impossible for our staff to be able to see every single bird in that aviary. Um, so we uh, have the spoons um, where you can like tap them together to make a sound. So we uh, chose the spoons and we collected all of their bugs or their mealworms, which are their favorite things in their diet, and pulled them aside um, for what we call a bug drop. So we ring the spoons and we throw bugs. So what is the association that the animal's making? I hear the spoons, I'm gonna get bugs. And we just started the training, but we're already seeing animals that we really don't see throughout the day come down and eat the bugs. So now that cuts down time for our staff that they have to sit there and take inventory on all the animals. It gives us a closer look at all of the birds. So if there's anything um, that we need to address with our vet team, that we can, we can do that. So training, again, doesn't have to be difficult. Um, we just have to be consistent. So making sure that the team is all doing the same thing and we're giving the same clear message to, um, to our animals because our whistle or the sound um, and our reinforcement is the only way that we can communicate with them. Uh, we also use operant conditioning. Um, that's just a fancy word for uh, learning through consequences. Um, so we're learning through consequences every day in our lives, and we want the staff to know that every day they have an opportunity to teach the animal even if they're just walking by a habitat. So anytime, any interaction you have with your animal is an opportunity to teach them something. So we focus on positive reinforcement and trust-based training. So we want the animals to trust us, and we want the animals to have more positive experiences with us than negative experiences. Um, so <clears throat> obviously using their food is the key to their heart, but um, what if the animal is sick? What if they don't want to eat? What do we have then? We have relationships, right? So this is my favorite part, is teaching the animals to want to be with us and have relationships with them. So I encourage the staff to spend tons of time, not that we have it, and as a zookeeper, you have a lot of work to do out there. You have a lot of cleaning, um, you have you know, a lot of poop cleaning from, for the elephants, some areas are less physically intensive than others, but can you pull out five more minutes in your day just to go spend time with your animals? So this, is, this, is so this is winter, and we this is very different than other dolphins. Um, we spend hours in the pool with her. Um, this is one of our black bears, Newberry. 
So she taught her, if I, if I, if I show you my uh, hands, you can lean in, I can give you some scratches on your head. This is one of our ponies, Lady. So anytime that, that the staff has a couple extra minutes, I'm like, please go spend time with your animals. Go hang out with them, build your relationship. Um, give them things that they like and find out what they like. So do they even like scratches or do they even know that you can give them scratches? Uh, this is Kumi, our six-year-old um, African elephant. <laughs> She's like, please don't stop. So we, we've been teaching the staff, especially with the elephants, to get in there and scratch them. They want it, they like it, you can see it. And to recognize those opportunities that you're seeing with the animals, to give them what they want, but to teach them, hey, I can give this to you. Like, I see you scratching on things in your, you know, out in your habitat. I can do that for you too. And then as you can see, like I've gotten her to like buckle at the knees and like lay down for scratches. She loves it. Um, so it's super fun, and, and teaching the staff to do that is, is probably the favorite part of my day. Um, enrichment also is incredibly important and goes right alongside with your training program. Um, so enrichment is something to help stimulate their environment, typically to encourage natural or species appropriate behavior. So you can see our giraffe, Bingwa, um, using that enrichment box. So these guys would spend about 16 hours of their day browsing. Um, they're very agile with their tongue. So using that little feeder, um, which also is really fun for our guests to see that tongue movement. Their tongues can be about 18 inches long. So getting to see that and giving him fun things to do throughout the day is definitely really neat. And then this is a video of one of our southern white rhino calves. Um, typically, white rhinos don't really like water, nor do they really enjoy it from the hose. But we were filling the drinker one day, and our baby was like trying to get in there. <laughs> so we were like, hmm, maybe he's a little bit interested. So we stayed a little bit longer to kind of play and hang out with him. Um, so enrichment, again, doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't necessarily have to be expensive. Um, and it takes a lot of observation for us to figure out what our animals actually really like. Um, so he was really intrigued by um, the hose there, as you can see, and I think he ends up getting both feet on the drinker and wants to like, get in there. So we just stayed a little bit longer, and then we would put our, fi our finger on the hose and make the stream a little bit um, you know, like stronger and see what he would do. So a lot of it is just kind of testing it out and seeing what they like, and then also taking a look um, at moving forward. So, you know, does this work for the animal? If it doesn't work, if they're not engaged by it, then don't do it. Go move on to something else that's going to work and, and achieve your behavioral goals. Um, I guess we have sound, so you guys can hear the trainer and hear talking to Jamie, one of our chimpanzees. Um, so this is a feeder. We had um, a couple donate um, this enrichment device to us. So the part that you can't see, um, which I think you see at the end of the video, is um, an automatic dog feeder that they connected to the button. So the button is the part that the animal can see. And um, so the animal can push the button to activate the feeder, and the feeder is dropping, I think, sunflower seeds or some type of seed for um, the chimpanzees. But Instead of the animal pressing the, learning to press the button and deplete everything that we have, they can, the button is only activated when the light is on. So the light lets the animal know, hey, I can come over and press this button, and something's going to happen. All right, Jamie, hit the button again. You did it before. You got it. Right here, Jamie. Good girl. Good girl. You can see the light. Good girl, Jamie. Yay. Good girl, Jamie. So this is really fun. We have we have a few of those. Um, we've used it for our black bear, our orangutans, our chimps, um, and we have one for our elephants as well. It looks a little bit different uh, for the elephants. It's a motion sensor, um, so we have to teach the animals first how to activate the sensor. Um, but the elephants would be able to lift their trunks activate the sensor and apples will roll out of machine. <laughs> so it's really cool and it's one of those things that gives them a little bit more choice and control over their environment. So if we set it up, then they can look for the light, go over there and know that they can grab some snacks if they activate um, their enrichment. 
Uh, one thing that I just want to briefly talk, talk about before I wrap up um, is something that I'm incredibly proud to be a part of um, at Zoo Tampa. So back in 2018, we had our first uh, conference for NextGen, Next Generation Elephant Management. Um, and being that we are a really progressive zoo, we're doing uh, some things that other zoos aren't doing. Um, but we want to teach staff and teach other elephant professionals how to interact with their elephants solely on positive reinforcement. Um, so if we're doing the same thing that we're doing now in 50 years, we have a problem. So some of the things that we're doing are still um, um, things that we've done the last 50 years, and we're trying to change that. So we're trying to teach staff that, hey, uh, we don't need any other type of equipment. We only need positive reinforcement. We need to have positive relationships with the animals and not necessarily teaching animals fear-based. So we um, started NextGem and invited elephant professionals out to come look at our program um, because a lot of programs still enter the same space with their elephants. And at some facility, there's nothing wrong with that. We just feel that you don't have to enter the same space with a 10,000 pound animal and that we can get all of the behaviors that we need completely voluntary and through positive reinforcement. So we're working with Precision Behavior. Um, they're a consulting company that helps our zoo but goes to other zoos to teach positive reinforcement training. And we're um, trying to pave the way to get all zoos and um, facilities globally, which would be amazing, to go to positive reinforcement. We know that animals love relationships. We know that we can create those relationships and it makes them more comfortable um, and it um, makes behavior more solid as well. So I'm super excited to be a part of that. It's one of the reasons why I left marine mammals to go to the zoo is to work with elephants and to kind of pave the way and teach other staff um, how they can how they can interact with their animals. So I'm super excited about that. I am so incredibly happy in my role and I would love for any questions that you guys might have um, or any feedback um, after the presentation. So thank you guys so much for coming and spending your morning with me. And um, one thing that I like to teach the staff as well is that we owe it to the animals. We owe it to them to have a solid training program to improve their well-being through our enrichment programs as well. And it is their job. Every day that they come in to that zoo, I know they have a lot of cleaning to do. Put that aside for a second and plan your day. How are you going to make that day the best day that, uh, for the animals? Think about what they're doing throughout the day. Not what you have to do, what are the animals doing, and how can you plan your day accordingly to make sure that animals have a different day, the best day, and a really fun day. So that's what I like to teach um, our staff, and we owe it to them. So, questions? Um, it is difficult, and one of the things that is unfortunate about what I do is I feel like I have to defend what I do. And especially coming from marine mammals, you know, I'm, if you've ever seen the um, documentary Blackfish, I think that's where it kind of all started. And there were a lot of misinformation and false things in that documentary, but it had an agenda and animal rights people have an agenda and they want you to feel a certain way. And so I do feel like I have to defend what I do, but I can talk about it till I'm blue in the face, is you do have animals under human care, but a lot of times that's your only opportunity to ever see them. And unfortunately, we're not taking care of the world that they live in, and the world that they live in isn't necessarily a good place for them anymore. So there are those people that come, we get them all the time, especially with marine mammals, um, but I wouldn't do what I do if I wasn't passionate about the care the animals are, are getting and that the training that they're getting isn't that I want to, again, train them to do circles. I want to increase their mind. I want to stimulate them cognitively. Um, again, a lot of people pay a lot of money to go into places like SeaWorld and zoos, but where else are they going to appreciate those animals? And what a lot of people don't know or don't want to know is that those facilities have the resources to do research, to rescue, rehabilitate animals, to send them back out into the wild if that's the safest thing for them. Um, so there's just a lot that I think animal rights people don't necessarily know or care to want to know. Um, 
but I always go back to, you know, the things that we're teaching our animals are to stimulate them and to give them some of the same cognitive opportunities that they would get in the wild. Question. Good question. She, if you couldn't hear her, she asked um, what kind of advice that I would give to someone trying to get into animal care is doing internships, um, volunteering at a zoo, aquarium. Um, you know, like we saw earlier in the presentation, as soon as I was able to have a job, I was working with animals and I got my foot in the door in the education department at um, the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. So I didn't have enough experience to get into animal care, so I got into the education portion and taught me a lot about the different species and how to interact with guests and kind of the ins and outs of the zoo a little bit. And then just applying for internships. Um, one of the things too, um, when I was applying for colleges, uh, my mom threatened me and said that I had to go to school at least two hours away because <laughs> I was uh, a little bit of a homebody, and I was nervous to uh, move away to go to college. Um, I don't know what happened, because after college, I was like, see you later. I'm going to go to Florida. Um, but, <laughs> but don't close yourself off to any opportunity. So um, there's not a zoo in every city. Um, it's not as common as you know working at a desk job or in business, let's say. So be willing to move anywhere and do whatever it takes. Um, so I moved to Miami and I didn't know a soul there. I, my dad drove me down, sent me on my way, and it was the best thing that I probably could have done. And you know, while I'm still in Florida, you know, I went to where the opportunities took me and I wasn't afraid to take that step. Um, so lots of experience, internships. Um, unfortunately, you might work for free for a little while. <laughs> so having extra jobs to be able to support yourself is important, but Definitely not being afraid to, to just get out there and take whatever opportunity presents itself to you. Anyone else? As far as getting into um, zoos and aquariums? Um, I think so. So as a hiring manager, um, I don't necessarily look at the very specific type of degree that you're getting. Um, it could be somewhere in the realm, zoology, biology, psychology. Um, I think all your animal experience will help to set you apart, maybe from someone else. So I wouldn't worry about that at all. Um, I probably you know, could have majored in psychology and still have taken the same path that I had. Um, so that's why I picked up psychology as a minor, just because I wanted to understand a little bit more of the behavioral side of things. Although I loved my biology classes and my science classes, um, I think once you start building up your experience with internships and you know volunteering or working at you know clinics or zoos or aquariums, that's going to build up your resume and that'll get your foot in the door. Um, I, well, first I applied to something a little bit close to home, because again, I was a little bit homebody. Um, so I got the internship at the Akron Zoo. Um, so I was looking for a little bit of convenience, what's close by, what can I do before I totally move away. But I specifically wanted to work with dolphins. So I researched dolphin internships. And of course, I wanted to be paid, although I was prepared to move to another state and not get paid for that. And the Miami Sea Aquarium internship was a paid internship. So that, kind of what drew me to Miami, Florida to, for that specific internship, but I probably would have taken any dolphin internship at the time. Um, but every zoo or aquarium has internship programs, so let's say you, you want to move to Florida, like that's just an area of interest to you. There's a ton of facilities, and I would just look up either their website um, or even go to AZA. Um, they have um, a job forum there where you can search where there's open positions, internships, things like that. Yes. How much time do you spend researching while you're preparing for um, training or internship or anything like that? Um, well, my, a lot of my day is not at the computer. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't even see my office um, some days. 
Um, so probably not as much time as I would like. Um, so when I'm developing these training programs and enrichment programs with the staff, um, I'm doing a lot of face-to-face. And I'm pretty new in, in my role, so I ask a ton of questions. So the animal staff that work with those animals are the experts for those animals. You know, I've never worked with um, a tiger before, so I ask the questions, well, what's their diet? What, what are their natural behaviors? Um, you know, what does your normal day look like? So I ask all the questions and get the answers from the experts that know them the best. And then I can take my behavioral side of things and say, okay, what if we, um, you know, at this time of the day, we're gonna shift them out and feed them a whole prey item, whatever that is. So the team lets me know what the animals need to get medically, um, making sure they're still getting everything that they need as far as veterinary care, but how can we shake up their day and change their training program to achieve the behavioral goals that we wanna get. So I would like to do more research and uh, be able to spend more time by the computer, but honestly, I'd rather be out in the field and talking to the people that work with the animals every day and making sure that I have a good understanding of what the animals need and then also what the staff needs and then we can work together to come up with the best plan. Are we running out of time? Thank you guys so much for being here today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Sue, thank you so much. We are so proud to call you an Euler alumna. You are just outstanding. And I am sure all of us just will take away so much knowledge today that we can apply to um, our dogs, cats, spouses, whatever. So, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. And I have to share with you, uh, when I called Sue uh, late summer to uh, invite her to come and do this, she said, you know, I gave her a couple dates, and she said, well, I'm happy to do it. And keep in mind just how well put together this presentation was. I mean, that was just incredible. But she said, you know, if I could wait till after the middle of November by about two weeks, that would be good because I've got a wedding to plan and then go back and do my job. So um, I think your time management skills are just, <laughs> just incredible. So again, thank you so much. Uh, we do hope that we'll see many of you or again, your friends, relatives uh, at Winter College. You can see the terrific type of programming that we have. And we actually, uh, one of our presenters is Jennifer Smith, Dr. Jennifer Smith, and she got her pre-vet degree here, went on uh, to get her veterinarian degree, then her anesthesiologist uh, specialization, and is now in charge of all of the animal research at the Henry Ford Health System. And uh, so she has some tremendous insights that she'll be sharing too. And we have several other outstanding presenters, including one of the students who had in our pharmacy program who has been doing research with our faculty on the brain cancer uh, that some of you may have read about. And uh, so we're very excited to hear what, uh, what all she has to share, but to know that she has been here as a student doing some groundbreaking research on that that has gotten national attention is pretty exciting. So a few other things. I want to make sure there are comment cards on the table and let us know your reaction and thoughts regarding today's presentation, also suggestions for future subjects that you would be interested in hearing about and or individuals. And if you are not receiving our emails about our Fridays at Finley, please put your name and email address on there and we can uh, get you into the system to receive that as well. Um, the tentative dates for next semester, we are still finalizing programs, but the tentative dates are on the program for today, so please put those on your calendar, but do check the website, and again, you'll be getting emails on that. Um, 
also want to ask you to please join me once more in thanking our sponsors, First Federal Bank. University of Finley thanks you so much for coming, for all you do. It is the season of giving. Please keep our students in mind as uh, you make your gifts this season. And uh, we wish you and yours very Merry Christmas. Thank you. <laughs>